Given the, America's history with racism and sexism, do you think America is ready to elect a black woman to be president? Yes. I am Terrell Jermaine Starr, senior reporter with The Root, and I am here with former gubernatorial candidate from the state of Georgia, Stacey Abrams. How you doing, ma'am? I'm well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So, uh, you have so many options in front of you right now, right? So, you have the option, according to news reports, of uh, running for president yourself or possibly uh, running for uh, U.S. Senate. So, what, what's the toughest aspect of making the right decision that's good for you? I use a framework that says, what's the right job, what's the right time, and am I the right person? And the way I think about it, it's really being thoughtful about what are the aspects of the job that attract me, what are the places where I would make the greatest impact, and can I affect the issues that matter to me most. I'm driven into politics by a deep ab abhorrence of poverty. I believe it robs us of human capital. I think it diminishes us as Americans, and I think it's a solvable problem. And my challenge is to determine where is the best platform on which to stand to really address these issues. But it's also a question of, do I want to do that job? I, I think it's difficult to say no to opportunity, but I think it's important not to do something simply because it's available. Uh, because once you've got it, you still have to do the work. And if you don't deeply want to do that work, then it becomes problematic. And that's why I'm trying to be very thoughtful and intentional. I had not thought about running for the Senate before. And so I'm trying to accelerate a timetable. I, I thought about governor for 10 years. <laughs> so, you know, trying to play catch up on the, the analysis of the Senate race. Any timeline on when you think you'll be ready to make a decision or not? My goal is to make a decision about whether to run for the Senate or not in the next few weeks. I will decide about the presidential campaign. That has a longer timetable. I, I do not believe that there is the type of urgency that some seem to believe there is. And there's always the opportunity to run for governor again, and I have to think about whether that's the job I still think I'm best suited for. And, and these, you know, these are zero sum. Picking one necessarily precludes the other. And so for me, I want to be very careful and intentional about the decision. Reflecting back on your time running for governor, uh, a whole lot of things happened, right, obviously. And do you feel like you experienced any racism of any kind during that run? Yes. <laughs> like what, tell us about it. I would say that the most directly targeted racial aspect uh, would be twofold. One were the commercials, the commercials that had racist, sometimes undertones, sometimes overtones. Uh, there was a commercial where they had someone tap dancing a la the menstrual uh, allegory and there was another where they had me climbing the side of the capital a la King Kong. And both of those carry deeply symbolic racist uh, tropes but they also speak to stereotypes. I would say writ large though I was very pleased by the reception that I received across the state and the fact that racism exists should never be a disqualifier for ambition and intention. And so, yes, there are those who disparage and deny my humanity because of who I am, but they are not the audience that I'm driven to serve, although they'll be helped anyway. What about the media? I, I would attribute it less to racism and more to a very narrow and immature ability to navigate the story of my campaign. I was doing a number of things that were new and different and discomforting to some. But what was worse is that for a lot of those folks, they, they could not comprehend how all of these things could be true at the exact same moment. I, I wouldn't necessarily ascribe any racial animus as much as I would uh, a lack of there, there was some incompetence in the coverage that was problematic. Do you believe that uh, black people should receive reparations? I believe African Americans, or I believe, yeah, African Americans and Native Americans are entitled to reparations. We are the two communities who were legally disenfranchised from the inception of this country, and we are the two communities who had legal structures that were put in place for such a long period of time that our ability to achieve and access 
uh, opportunity at a level that was commensurate with the rest of America was just not available. As you're thinking about running for whatever office you decide eventually, is that going to be a part of your plan in regards to formulating what reparations could look like for us? I think that we have to have a conversation about what reparations should look like and that shouldn't be the domain of a single person. In part because I don't know enough to know what the answer is, but I should be a part of the conversation and part of convening uh, those who can provide an answer because this is a complex issue and I think anyone who would say that it's simplistic is being uh, disingenuous. Why do you think so many people, including progressives, feel that identity politics weakens Democrats' chances of winning, especially against Donald Trump? Progressives have been convinced by a narrative that falsely understood the 2016 election. Hillary Clinton did not lose the election because of identity politics. She did not lose the election because she acknowledged and centered disadvantaged and marginalized communities. She lost due to a combination of factors that included, for some, a lack of recognition of their identity in the organizing done in the election. Identity politics is nothing more complicated than saying, I see you and I understand the obstacles that you face to accessing opportunity and to, to having barriers to your future removed. I believe we need to not only embrace identity politics, but expand and deliberately talk about it because the more people see themselves in our politics, the more likely they are to do something about it, which is voting, and voting is how we win elections. Do you feel like the current Democratic Party as it stands is adequately equipped to support black women who want to run for office? The party is one part of the apparatus and the infrastructure for elections. And the extent to which we put all of the responsibility on a single component, we essentially exonerate everyone else from responsibility. I believe our responsibility is to make certain that we have investors who see black women as viable candidates, that we have a party that provides access to opportunity, that we have consultants who actually provide legitimate advice that takes into account our experiences, especially our lived experiences and how differently we are viewed. That means doing research to understand how we enter a space as a candidate. We have to hold the entire ecosystem accountable and we are starting to do that, but we have a lot more work to do but I don't ascribe responsibility solely to the, the party. What, what specific role do you think they should have? Because a lot of criticism has been weighed towards them because of the power that the party holds. And that's what I'm saying. When we say that the Democratic Party is or is not doing something, I, when I push people, when they actually give responses, they don't actually mean the party. The party is largely an organizational structure that allows candidates to raise money. It allows states to organize their voter files. Mm -hmm. It provides uh, convening power for conversations about our platform and it does have some organizing responsibilities but as a candidate it's not just about what the party is doing it's about what is the state party doing it's a question of what are consultants doing it's what donors are doing and so I think we do have to hold the party accountable and I think the party has improved its in interactions and responsibilities but I think our real opportunity is a larger narrative that looks at the entire democratic ecosystem and says if you want to see more black women in power, you've got to be a part of making that power real. Given America's history with racism and sexism, do you think America is ready to elect a black woman to be president? Yes. We saw what happened, what happened in Georgia, right, that impact, but when we think about a larger uh, America, there are so many people who still have doubts because it just hasn't happened before nationwide. The argument, th those are two different ideas. One is, did Georgia reject me because I'm black? The answer is no. Georgia did not have a fair election, and therefore we don't know what the outcome would have been. But as a singular matter, I received more votes than any candidate in Georgia history, including Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton. The other conversation is can you cull together a sufficient number of votes across 50 states to win an electoral college victory? And I think a black woman can absolutely do that. You started Fear Fight Action um, in Georgia because of voter suppression, right? Yes. And I want to ask you how serious of an issue should this be for all Democrats who are running for president? Voter suppression has to be the number one issue because you cannot solve a single policy concern if people do not have the right to vote. We do not elect dictators, we do not elect autocrats, we elect presidents. Presidents rely on congressional leaders, they rely on state leaders. All of those folks are determined by the right to vote and if the right to vote is not preserved, and more importantly, if it is not restored, 
then we will not win elections and make the changes we need to make. There are a number of bills around the country that are limiting women's rights and, and access to abortion. And I wanted to ask you, how can Democrats push back against these bills? I think Democrats have to first call these bills what they are, which are forced pregnancy bills. But we also have to acknowledge that access to abortion is part of reproductive health, and therefore it's part of reproductive justice. Particularly for African American women, our lack of access to a full range of reproductive choices limits our ability to not only dis determine our families, it also harms our ability to engage in the economy. And so I believe every Democrat has to have a full conversation about the whole of reproductive justice, from maternal mortality rates to access to abortion to access to contraception and family planning, and that reproductive health has to be our push. But we can never shy away from the fact that abortion is a central part of that. Flynn's gone years without uh, drinkable water from the tap. What should the next president do to address this issue? I think that the next budget that is passed needs to include funding that treats Flint and any similarly situated community as a national emergency and they should be prescribed uh, the type of financial resources necessary to make their water potable. So there's an issue that people uh, are talking about here and there and it's decriminalization of sex work, right? And what are your thoughts about uh, the idea that sex work should be decriminalized? I think we've seen in a number of countries and in a number of states progress made towards m making certain that women are protected. And that ultimately should be the point. Women should not put their lives at risk because of sex. And whether it is seen as a commercial enterprise or it's human trafficking, our obligation is to create a safe space so that no woman risks her life because of sex. You've gained a lot of uh, profile, obviously, nationally uh, during your, as a result of your run in Georgia. Do you really have any concerns about your safety as you continue to rise in the party? We have had security for me uh, because there are those who disagree with who I am and what I'm doing. Um, but my responsibility is to do the work that I'm called to do. And my obligation is to make sure I'm safe enough to do it. What makes you feel confident and and to keep going uh, despite you know this uh, you know these uh, potential threats to your safety? The threats are not things that I wouldn't say they don't concern me, but they aren't dispositive. My responsibility, if I want to do this work, my responsibility is to give it my all, to say what I think is true and real, and to listen and trust that if I do my work we will see change, and that keeps me going.